is Matt, welcome back to the shop and this is another episode of Bike Tech and today we are looking at upside down fox. So, like as before, we're going to go through it. Why are they upside down? Grab that. Are they even better? And why aren't all bikes the same? So to understand why they are upside down, I've got a picture up right now, you can see there's some conventional shocks as we call them and then we've got some USD, some upside down forks. So to understand why they've been turned upside down is we need to understand a bit about suspension and then on the tail end of that we need to understand what unsprung mass is and sprung mass. So for this example of what unsprung and sprung mass is, we've got a wheel for each example. So you have an axle and then your fork and then you have the entire bike. If I can draw on the side. So this bike has mass, so we'll say that's 150 kgs, and the suspension is acting in between the wheel, which is obviously on the road, and the mass of the bike. So what we say is, everything that's part of the wheel system that follows the road surface, if it's undulating or a couple of bumps or a storm drain or some shit like that, is unsprung. This is not suspended. This is this. The suspension doesn't act on the wheel. Everything that is between the unsprung mass and the suspension, everything that is suspended by a suspension system, is sprung mass. So the bike you is is sprung mass. The suspension is taking out any undulations on the road, and the mass shouldn't feel it above that point. So on our second example, it begs the question, what is sprung and what is unsprung? Because there's a bit where it gets a bit furry. So your wheel, your tyre, your brake caliper, your disc, they're all unsprung mass. And with a conventional bike, you have the fork body, which is basically just a closed end tube. And then you have your statue, the nice shiny chromed fork that goes in between. So we would say that the body, the fork body, is unsprung because the, the suspension element, the spring, sits in between the two. Now for conventional shocks that are fitted to most bikes through the years, until the last 30, 40 years, this made sense because you want the suspension to suspend most of the mass, like with the bike. Out of these two tubes, the statue, which is the actual fork itself, the shiny chrome fork tube, is heavier. It's a steel tube that's been chromed. It's quite robust. Generally, nowadays, the fork body is made out of aluminium. And that's why it's made out of aluminium, because it's light. And this is why it's attached to the wheel. And it's the element that's attached to the wheel, so that the unsprung mass is low. So what's the crack with this sprung unsprung business with suspension? The main reason is, is that if you have a bumpy road just say, and your wheel is tracking along this, heavier things have uh, less tendency to want to move, it's all to do with inertia and momentum. So what happens is, is if you have a bumpy road, this wheel is less likely to move freely, and the suspension itself can only respond to the wheel movement, which means that vibrations actually come up the shock body and it shakes the whole bike. Your, your, your comfort level isn't very good. You also can lose traction. If you have a lighter wheel, the lighter wheel can deflect and move around a lot easier because it's easier to move a lighter weight. Hence why the conventional shock and the conventional wisdom at the time was to have a light as light as possible unsprung mass. Over the years bike manufacturers, and it always starts in racing as usual, realised that because of the weight difference between the unsprung mass and the sprung mass wasn't such a large margin like it is with cars, that if they actually flip the forks upside down it didn't really make that much difference to the unsprung sprung mass argument. So then the question has to be asked, is there any benefits from having an upside down fork? Is there any benefits from having a 
you know, a heavier mass having the statch and the heavier tube at the bottom and the fork body in the top. When it comes to sprung and unsprung mass, it's a negative, but the negative is so incredibly small that the other um, positives from turning the, upside, the fork upside down were more important than the unsprung, sprung mass debate argument. So now we're actually getting to it. What is the difference? What are the benefits? Now that we're not too bothered about unsprung and sprung mass and we can kind of put that argument to bed, what is the benefits of either system? Well, because we're doing USD forks, we'll actually just reverse it one way. We'll just look at why there's benefits of having an upside down fork. So the first thing to look at is the York, or the triple tree as the Yanks say, is the attachment point here and here on both setups. You've got a fork sticking out as a lever, weight is applied to the bike, resistance from the road, your actual friction and motion, and then there's braking, there's all these forces. And what happens is, is that if you try and bend this fork, so you're going to bend it this direction, the focal point of the bend is actually there, the fulcrum is there, the pivot point is here and the diameter of the statue is a lot smaller so you have less to grip onto because it's a smaller diameter tube because it has to go into the fork body. This puts added stress on the bearings that are placed here and hence why if you look at your bearings the bearing on the bottom of your steering column is a lot bigger and beefier than the one at the top. That's because it has to contend with this bending. When looking at the USD fork, the uh, di outer diameter of the fork body is a lot bigger. And believe it or not, aluminium is actually a stiffer metal than steel, like for like. Also, because your bending point is here, but this is a hell of a stiffer um, sh shock body that's in your yoke, that means the actual statching tube can actually be thinner and lighter overall because it's not taking the bend so much. It's more of the actual fork body, which is aluminium, and like I said, it's stiffer. It's more resistant. It's a larger diameter. So this is all great. It means you can make something lighter, but this still doesn't point out why we'd still have it on the MotoGP bikes and why you have it on motocross bikes and all the rest of it. The main reason is, is, especially with the MotoGP bikes or race bikes, is that you get more feel. Like I was saying about unsprung and sprung mass and how it transfers through a, a larger unsprung mass, motorbike um, riders can feel more of the road, they can feel more of what the front end is doing, because one, it's a stiffer setup, but number two is there is more of an unsprung mass giving that feedback. Why you do it on motocross is completely the other reason, the other way around. You actually want, because it's massively undulating uh, road surface that you're riding on, you actually want the um, tyre not to respond as much as it would if they were standard size forks. Because it's a heavier mass, it doesn't want to respond as much. So the tyre is more likely to stay more in contact with the surface that you're riding on. So motocross and motogp are using upside down forks for two completely different reasons motogp are racing for feed and feedback and they can actually when they design it out make it lighter and the motocross boys are using it because they don't want their wheel to be bouncing up and having a lot of stroke all the time so the reason why shocks aren't the same across every single motorbike why aren't they all upside down forks one is because a lot of development and money has been put into upside down forks so generally Upside down forks are more expensive, so they go on the more expensive machines like your Yamaha R1s and your GSXRs and your racing bikes, and actually your motocross bikes because they're all specialist stuff. You know, you can't usually ride a, motor, um, a motocross bike on the road, it's an off road guilty pleasure kind of thing. A lot of research and development and design work has been put into upside down forks, so generally they're more expensive. So when you get your normal standard bike, so like the ER5 or you get a Honda Goldwing or something like that, they tend to just go with what they know, it works, and it does actually ever so slightly give you a smoother ride. There's less feedback, less vibration, and because of the unsprung, sprung mass weight argument, it is ever so slightly comfier. So 
and this will never change. There will be always upside down and conventional forks, and the reason why they're called conventional forks is because most motorbikes have them. But the, you know the ways are changing nowadays. Um, USD forks are kind of like saying ABS and traction control and fuel injection. We'll start to see them filter through. So probably in 20 years, every single bike that's ever released will have USD forks because people, you know, some people think they look better. I don't. I think they look quite ugly. But you know, any road. If you uh, like the video, please do the thingy. If you've got any comments, if you've got any suggestions of anything you want me to go through, please leave them in the comment things below. Go on Facebook. You can ask me on there, and uh, we'll see you in a bit.